This morning, the Common English Bible is used for the scripture, which is 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, through chapter 2, verse 2. The writer says, This is the message that we have heard from him and announced to you. God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. If we claim we have fellowship with him and live in the darkness, we are lying and do not act truthfully. But if we live in the light, in the same way as he is in the light, we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from every sin. If we claim we do not have any sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from everything we have done wrong. If we claim we have never sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you do not sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is God's way of dealing with our sins, not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Let us pray. Your word, O Lord, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Light our way today. Lord Jesus. Amen. One of my favorite authors died last month, Ray Bradbury. Fantastic author. Uh, died at the age of 92. Great loss to the literary world, really just to our world. Uh, I decided in honor of his passing that I was going to reread some of my favorites. So I recently reread Dandelion Wine. Uh, tells the story of a young boy, 10 years old, Douglas Spaulding, of his magical summer of 1925. Uh, wonderful book, I really recommend it to you, Dandelion Wine. Uh, Douglas's uh, best friend in the book is John Huff, uh, kind of John, uh, Douglas's hero. And uh, one scene of the book deals with John revealing to Douglas that he is about to move that night. Now, I can't think of much of a greater tragedy in the life of a 10-year-old than your best friend moving and not giving you uh, any prior notice of that. So John tells Douglas that he is moving that night, and he said, you know what, Douglas? Ever since I knew that I had to move, I've been looking around this town, this town that I've grown up in. I've been looking around, and I've been seeing things for the first time. And he said, did you, did you know that th this house that we pass by every week did you know that there's a stained glass window up on the second floor? And Douglas says, no, I didn't know that. And John says, we've been passing by this house for 10 years of our life, and we've never noticed the stained glass window. We've never noticed the beauty that's up there. What else have we missed? What else have we missed? Uh, this makes me think of something that I've missed for a lot of years, especially uh, my college years, and that was uh, sunrises. Uh, I missed a lot of sunrises uh, in college, but uh, when we moved here to Myrtle Beach, uh, of course, one of my favorite activities is running, and so I would go and, and run down on the beach at dawn, and the sun would just pop out over that horizon halfway through my run, and there it would be, and, and the colors were magnificent. It was gorgeous. It was beautiful. I was one of the only people out there on the beach. I felt that it was God's gift to me, that sunrise, and I thought to myself, how could I have missed this? all those years. Now, unfortunately, today I do have to miss the sun rising because of the way that my own sun rises in the morning. Uh, so I have to intentionally remind myself that sun comes up over that ocean every day. Remember, remember the beauty, remember the gift of that sun rising. One of the ways that I think uh, we, we do celebrate that sunrise is, is on Easter. You know, we have our Easter sunrise service every year. Uh, about 300 people get together, uh, wake up early, and get together down at Plowler Park 
and, uh, and we worship the risen sun, God's risen sun, as the sun comes up and rises over that ocean. And that's a great way to celebrate Easter with the rising of that sun. But today, think about it, it's been a long time since Easter. That sun has come up and risen every other morning since. We've gone back to our daily routines and our business. It's, it's, it's business as usual, life as usual. We forget the sun rising. Maybe we even forget God's sun rising. Everything is back to normal. And maybe some of that darkness has started to creep back in too. But we need to remember that Easter for us, for us gathered here, Easter is not just a day. It's not just a season. Easter is a way of life for us because we are followers of the risen Son of God and Easter should be our whole lives. Bishop Will Willimon says that we should be agents of Easter. We are Easter agents. Willimon also says that he asked a student one day to um, describe the gospel in as short of a sentence as possible. And this is what the student said. In the Bible, it gets dark. Then it gets very, very dark. Then Jesus shows up. Jesus, God's light of the world, shows up on earth, shows up after dying on a cross, and continues to show up wherever there is darkness, wherever there is death. He shows up. We need to remember that God's light is greater, greater than dark. If you were at our uh, last Easter sunrise service this past April, uh, we had a little prelude. It was a recording that I played. Uh, it's, it's a song called Tallahassee, and it's by a group called Abraham the Poor. And uh, I, I want to read this to you. In, in the song, it's really a spoken word song, and, and it's God that is speaking to us. And this is what God says in this song. Liken me to a Tallahassee sunrise or to the silver break of the moon in the Spanish cobbled streets in the milk black night. And just when you think you've described me in all my fullness, still I will defy you with an unbreakable shiver in the ears and a pulse of heat in the chest. And it is then that you will know that I am greater than all else. For fan blades and prison bars foil me not, nor dark shades or even darker shades of lightless night, because even these are mine. And shall I shudder or shy away from that which I have made? Or am I not the one who told the dark how dark to be, so that my great light might shine more gloriously in comparison? I hold all this together alone. As Easter people, we need to remember that the great light of God is shining gloriously, continuously, even today, even in the middle of a holiday weekend at the end of summer, the light of God's resurrection is shining brightly. We cannot avoid it. And we can't close our eyes to it. But we sure try. We sure try to avoid it, and we sure try to close our eyes shut so God's light won't get in. Because God's light, you know, it shines in the the darkness of our own lives. It kind of illuminates the darkness that's in each of our hearts. It spotlights, let's just call it sin. It spotlights our sin. And we try to hide from that light. No wonder we prefer walking in darkness because it keeps us from seeing our own sinfulness. So there's some ways that I think that we tend to walk in the darkness. And one of them is when we do not live together in unity. John, the writer of our our scripture text, calls this fellowship with each other. And he says we're in fellowship with, with each other and therefore we are in fellowship with God. Psalm 133, which we sang earlier today for our Psalter, Uh, says how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together in unity. Now this psalm, you know, all the psalms were songs that were sung in the worship life 
of Israel. Well, this particular psalm, 133, is called a song of ascent. And it was sung as, as pilgrims came. You know, uh, there, there was really one place to worship in, in Israel, and that was in the temple in Jerusalem. And so people would travel from all uh, directions, north, south, east, west. They would come together and, and walk up to the temple, walk up the temple stairs to worship in the temple. And this was one of the songs that they sang as they walked up those stairs to come together. How good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together in unity. Imagine that scene. Imagine thousands of people coming together from all walks of life to go up into the temple in unity to worship the Lord. I mean, if you've been to, a, to Williams Bryce and been to a Gamecock game, think about everybody wearing their Gamecock colors and walking up into, the, okay, Clemson fans, I'll give it to you too. Okay, walking into Death Valley and, and, and everybody coming together, you know, it's that times 100. How good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters come together and live in unity. Now, there's some other interesting imagery in this psalm. Maybe some of you were grossed out a little bit by the, the image of oil flowing down a beard. That's kind of gross today, but back then... That was actually a sign of hospitality. When you came to somebody's house, they offered to wash your feet, but also to anoint your head with oil. It was a sign of hospitality. So, so if you've got oil flowing down off your head into your beard, you've, somebody has been very hospitable to you. They've given you a lot of oil for your head. Aaron, if you're wondering who that is, he was Moses' brother, and he kind of represents the high priestly tradition of Israel. So we have this image of great hospitality that is flowing down. It's hospitality that can't be contained. The psalm also mentions Hermon. Mount Hermon was one of the tallest mountains in Israel. And in the summertime, the only refreshment, the only water that the mountain received was from the dews in the morning. And of course, they looked on this as a gift from God. It was God gifting the mountain with refreshment. So in this psalm, we've got unity, we've got everyone coming together, we've got hospitality that is rampant, that is overflowing, and we have refreshment, we have signs of God's gifts all happening when we live together in unity. But I don't have to stand up here and tell you today that too often we don't live in unity, in here, out there, everywhere. We're going to see that this fall. We've already seen it, and it's ramping up, and it's going to get worse before November. I'm not looking forward to that. But it happens inside these walls as well. I just got back from a, uh, a half-week vacation with uh, a lot of my family uh, on my side. Uh, let me just say that uh, in our family, we put the fun in dysfunctional, all right? So there were, there were 17 of us in a house designed for 12 people, um, we come from all different walks of life. We come from all different parts of the country, uh, north, south, east, west, and, and you know, all different uh, ways of thinking, attitudes, philosophies, theologies, all different kinds. But, you know, when we get together and when we're on vacation, you know, during the day we kind of go off and do our own thing. Some of us go to the beach, some of us go to the pool, some of us sit inside and type away on our laptops. But at night, at dinner time, we all come together at one table, one long table. And it's noisy, and it's cacophonous, and it's confusing, but we all come together and we sit at the same table and we share stories. We share our lives with each other. We say, don't you remember back when this happened? And oh, I'm so looking forward. We, we share our entire selves. As different as we all are, as dysfunctional as we all are, we sit at the same table. But we are a church family. We put the fun in dysfunctional, but we are a church family. And we come from north, south, east, west. We come from different ways of thinking, different views on things, different theologies, different philosophies. But we all come together at the same table. And we share our lives with each other. And we say, remember when this happened, and oh, we're so looking forward to the future, and let me tell you about my story, and I want to hear yours. We share ourselves together at the same table. We are a family, and we need to be an example to the world of a family that is united. We might not think the same, but we can sure love the same. We are a family who sits down at the same table, and we need to be an example for the world of what that looks like, of what walking in God's light looks like, of what unity looks like. Another way that we can walk in darkness, 
We deny our own sin, but we focus on the sins of others. We're sure, we're sure good at doing that. You know, the writer of John talks about that. You know, we, if, if we deny our sin, then guess what? We're liars. But, you know, we're really good at focusing on the sins of others. Jesus even nailed it when he said, you know, you, you, you focus on the speck in someone else's eye, and yet you're ignoring the huge log that's sticking out of your own. It's bad enough when we do that to fellow Christians. You know, I've heard it said that Christians are the only ones who shoot their wounded. It's bad enough when we do that. But we think we're in the clear when it comes to people who aren't Christians, when it comes to people outside. Oh, you know, we're okay. We can pick on them. We can point out their sins because they're not in here. They're not part of our family. There's been something very troubling lately that I've noticed online. And I know that, you know, I, I, I proclaim the glories of being online, but there's also some dark sides, and here's one of them. You know, there, there, there are things that go around, uh, they're, they're called memes, if you're, if you're up on internet speak, but memes are things that, that kind of catch on, they go viral, they, they, they go all out there, they spread around. Uh, I, I saw this meme uh, recently, and this is what it says, it's just like one of those big picture thingies, and it says, atheism, the belief that there was nothing, and nothing happened to nothing, and then nothing magically exploded for no reason, creating everything, and then a bunch of everything magically rearranged itself for no reason whatsoever into self-replicating bits which then turned into dinosaurs. Makes perfect sense. Now you're nervously chuckling at that because you think it's funny. I know, I know, I think it's funny too, but is this a way to shed light into the world? Is this a way to walk in the light or is this just going to create more darkness where there already is darkness. This is so snarky. This is so sarcastic. This is so mean. And I know we mean well when we put it out there and say, aha, uh -huh, you know, but this isn't doing anything to draw atheists into our fellowship. In fact, this is giving them more ammunition against us. See those Christians? <laughs> They're not acting like Christians. Let me tell you about some Christians who did act like Christians, though. Patrick Green uh, is a self-professed atheist. He sued the Henderson County, Texas, um, I guess the, the county, uh, over a manger scene. Uh, didn't want a manger scene put up uh, because it went against his beliefs. He said that my wife and I never had a Christian do anything nice for us. In fact, just the opposite. So he was mad and he decided to take it to court. He was a little bit flabbergasted when he found out that he needed some expensive eye surgery. He was losing his sight. And a Baptist church contacted him and said, we want to help you out. We want to provide you with some money. Uh, we, we can't pay for all of your surgery, but we can provide you with at least enough to cover the groceries and, and to get you by and, and, and to, to help you out a little bit. He said, I can't believe it. I thought I was in the twilight zone. These people are acting like what the Bible says a Christian does. So he's decided to stop protesting. He's even offered to buy a star for next year's nativity scene. He was surprised that these Christians were doing what the Bible says a Christian does. Why does that surprise people? We need to think about that. Doing what the Bible says a Christian does, realizing that we all sin, we all fall short of God's glory, every one of us, realizing that we are all made in God's image and then loving the ones who don't love us, showing them hospitality, offering them a place at the table, even if we think they won't accept it. That is what walking in the light is. Fellowship, not just within the family, but fellowship out there as well. But as much as we try, we just keep walking in that darkness. We keep denying that God's light shines brighter than any earthly darkness. And really what's underlying all of that, underneath everything, is fear. We are afraid. We're all afraid of something. And we let that fear run us and run our lives instead of letting faith run our lives. We're going to talk more about that next week. But today, let's just remember that it's always darkest before the dawn. Let's remember that God's great light shines more gloriously than any human earthly darkness 
that's out there. Tony Campolo is a pretty well-known minister, and he met with some survivors of Auschwitz one day. Auschwitz was uh, one of the most horrific Nazi concentration camps. And he asked these survivors, he said, do you just cringe whenever you hear a German accent? And one of the men says, no, no, I don't. He says, I think about the folks who, you know, they, they used to transport uh, the, the folks going to the camps, they used to transport them in cattle cars, and they were jammed into these cattle cars, train cars. And he says, when I hear a German accent, I think of the folks who, in, under the cover of darkness, crept out of the woods when we were stopped in these little towns, and these people would come and offer us food as we were on our way to the camps. And he says, when I hear a German accent, I think maybe this could be the grandchild of one of those folks who showed us kindness, who showed us light in a time of deep darkness. Campolo says that then at the end of this meeting, all the survivors gathered around in a circle and they held hands and they sang, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. And Tony inquired about that. He said, why, why did you sing that song in particular? And they said, every morning in the camp, we would get together and we would circle up and we would hold hands and we would sing a happy song to remind us that there is happiness out there even in the midst of all this despair. And that reminds me, uh, I, used to te I was a teacher for a while and I used to teach a, a Holocaust unit. And in, uh, in one of the ghettos, you know, they rounded up the Jews into ghettos before they took them to the camps. In one of the ghettos, there was found, scrawled on the wall, this poem. I believe in the sun, even when it is not shining. I believe in love, even when I feel it not. I believe in God, even when God is silent. We saw the sun rise last Easter. We worshiped God's sun rising last Easter, and we celebrate that Easter glory every Sunday that we come. Every Sunday is a little Easter in the life of the church. So we can't let the darkness back in. The good news is that God's light is greater, greater, greater than any darkness. And God's light doesn't just shine a light on our sin, but it offers us hope and healing in the midst of it. Listen to what John says again. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from everything we've done wrong. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you don't sin, but if you do sin, and we do, we have an advocate with the Father. And that advocate is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is God's way of dealing with our sins, not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. So as an Easter people, we acknowledge our sin. We don't wallow in it, but we acknowledge it. And we give it up to God and let Jesus Christ deal with our sins. We admit, as Easter people, we admit that we live in darkness, but we so want to live in the light. We admit that sometimes we walk in those shadows, but we do all that we can to step out of those shadows and into God's light. And we do this by confessing our darkness to the one who is light, Jesus Christ, and whose light always covers us and always, always, always forgives us. Several months ago, we lost uh, someone here at First Church who, who uh, I was very close to, a gentleman by the name of Carl Kitts. Maybe some of you knew Carl. And at his funeral, this poem is read. It's a poem called Soliloquy. It's by Bernard Patrick. It says, I've heard it said that the world's a dismal place, but I know better. I've heard it said that the world is sad. I can't agree. I've even heard that the world is evil, but they are wrong. I've heard them say these things, but I would disagree because for every shadow, I've seen a hundred rays of light. For every plaintive note, I've heard a symphony of joy. For every penny weight of bad, I've found a ton of good. Good in nature, good in people, good in the world, and I am thankful that I belong. And I am thankful that I belong and that you belong and that we belong to a world 
that is created by a good and loving and light-filled God. This God who is not foiled by dark shades nor darker shades of lightless night. This God who does not shudder nor shy away from anything that he has made. This is the God who told the dark how dark to be so that his great light, Jesus Christ, the light of the world, might shine more gloriously in comparison to any darkness that we can throw at it. Friends, God's great light is shining gloriously. Jesus Christ is the one who brings light and life to the dark and dead places, and he asks asks us, bids us to follow him, to follow him into these dark places as he shines a light. And all he asks us to do is follow and reflect that light into the dark corners of the world. So let us do that. Let us be light bearers, light bringers. Let's get out there and be mirrors that reflect nothing but God's great light into the world. Thanks be to God. Amen.